praise the Lord. Good to see you this evening again. Uh, we had a great night last night with uh, Ziggy. Good to have you back with us again today, Ziggy. And I look forward to the, the word that you have for us this evening. Once again, we were blessed, blessed, blessed last night. And challenged by the word as well too. And I know that we'll be challenged again tonight. So let's open the word of prayer. But as we do, just as we started last night with we'll we Q&A, think of a question or two for Ziggy. Uh, don't ask him did he play guitar. I think he's got a wee bit sick of that uh, <laughs> as well. No, he didn't get his name through David Bowie or anything like that. So but have a wee think uh, about um, what you'd like to ask him uh, just by, by way of starting this evening. So praise the Lord. Father, we thank you once again that we're found here in your house. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to open the door again to think about the wonderful things of God. Father, we thank you for singing here this evening. We pray, Lord, that you would bless him tonight. Lord, as our prayer has been throughout the day for him, that you would bring to his remembrance everything that you wish him to say here in the house. I pray, Lord, that we have open ears, open hearts, speakers receptive to your word here tonight, O oh God. Father, for those who are joining us online as well too, may they know the blessing of the Lord. And Lord, may the word that we receive this evening do us good. And Lord, as we've been praying and thinking about throughout the week, Lord, we know that we celebrate the resurrection every day. But Father, in this week, leading up to Resurrection Sunday, we think of the footsteps of the Lord Jesus as he made his way to Calvary. And Lord, this evening, we're thinking about the Levitical offering, and we think of the greatest offering of all, which was your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So bless us, we pray this evening. Bless our speaker, and bless here alike, in Jesus' lovely name. Amen. 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 Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. And, uh, it's great to be here again. And we're, going to, we're going to talk about Christ and the offerings today. And if you were here yesterday, this kind of follows on, but it's still very independent. Um, so we begin with some, um, let me pray, and then you can ask them some questions. Uh, Lord Father, we ask that this would be a time where we would be dedicated to thinking about what you have done. That's your Lord. Help us to concentrate, help us to strive to understand, help us to mature, help us to seek the things of your Son, maybe as never before, help us to strive towards enter your kingdom. We do pray, Lord, above all, you would give us words that we can share with people around us, maybe we can teach them things of your Son. <coughs> Fill us afresh, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so you, you want to ask me a couple of questions, but no more than 17. <laughs> what questions would you like to begin with? Okay, I'll start. Uh, this is a question that was asked to me today by my daughter to ask you. Uh, in your opinion, and I know you know the answer is going to be, uh, do you prefer Hanukkah or Christmas? Oh, okay. Because with the Hanukkah, you've got eight crazy nights, and Christmas, you've only got one. Um, I mean, that's a complicated set to answer. Because we often joke, you know, we're. Jewish or Christian, we say, "Well, I'm 100% Jewish and 100% Christian, so that means I get I get I get double of everything, so <laughs> Hanukkah and Christmas." But also, above all, I think when we celebrate Hanukkah, we understand. We often say, "Without Hanukkah, there would be no Christmas," mm. because Hanukkah is the story of the Jewish people and uh, and their persecution and what would be their annihilation, and as they as they could have just ceased to be a nation as they assimilated, and so. Without Hanukkah, without their, their victory that God gave them, this victory, uh, that, that wouldn't have given rise to the Messiah. So without Hanukkah, there's no Christmas. So actually, we celebrate both of them simultaneously. Mm. Uh, with my, um, uh, We light the, 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 the Hanukkah candles with my children. And for, for reasons I, I cannot explain, they like to sing happy birthday. So, <laughs> 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 uh, but it's, it's good fun and um, they're very health and safety conscious because when it's time for bed they just want to blow them out which is, uh, which is great because <laughs> you're thinking uh, it would be nice to let them to burn but they just want to blow them out so. <laughs> and also as I'm lighting them they like to blow them out so it makes it really challenging <laughs> so fond memories next question thank you <laughs> Not all at once, please. Yes. <laughs> We're awful shy. <laughs> the question you want to ask me, of course, is, is about my name. Right? Is that the question you were thinking of? 
we'll go with that again, yeah. Okay, yeah. she said the whole the Bowie thing. Um, my fact, my father did, does have a copy. He gave me that copy of the of, of, of Bowie's album, uh, Ziggy Stardust. But I'm actually um, named after Ziggy Short from Zygmunt, and I'm named after my grandmother's father who perished in the Holocaust. And so, as the firstborn grandson, I'm named in memory of of him. Uh, and I think that that must have been incredibly touching for my my grandmother. Because in 1939, in the months leading up to the Second World War, uh, her parents saw the writing on the wall, so she left them, mum and dad, and brothers and sisters, and nephews and nieces. And at the age of 26, she made the very difficult journey. I mean, clearly not understanding a word of English, how this even works, we do not know. But she came to, to England. Um, she said goodbye to, to her family. She could, ne could not have known that she was never going to see them again. And, so the family legend goes on the very first morning, working for this English family, she, she was asked to cook bacon for the family. And if you have any idea, if you have any notion of Jewish people, you know anything about Jewish people, you know that we don't do the bacon. My grandmother responds by saying, that she says, I'm Jewish and I can't cook your bacon. And the family tragically responded by saying they would make every single effort to have her deported. And she ran away from that home that very night. But that's not how she told the story. She said, a Christian family had wanted to deport her. From my grandma's very narrow perspective, either you're Christian or Jewish, his family clearly wasn't Jewish on account of the bacon, and when they wanted to deport her, it only confirmed every prejudice she already had. So that, that story, in some sense, gives us a sense of the them and the us. And, it, and so it should come as no surprise, as I was growing up, that my parents never had the kind word to say about Jesus or Christianity. And, uh, and I, I this, for really seriously misguided, mis for very mis can't even speak, um, and came to believe in a very misguided way uh, that Christians were responsible for, for the Holocaust. I think I found it very confusing when I, I, it seemed to me Christians were, were apologizing for the Holocaust. That confused me um, because actually th th they were responsible. So that confused me. Um, so, so my name really stands as, as a monument to the memory of millions of Jewish people mm -hmm. who died for the single reason that they're Jewish. So that's my name, Zygmunt. Mm -hmm. But people call me Ziggy. Yeah. Yeah. So where's the family back for Poland or Germany? He was in Slovakia. Slovakia, did they survive the Holocaust? A, a did they survive the Holocaust? I can't hear The family that was left behind? Yes, yeah, so, yeah, th um, there was no one. The, uh, to make, uh, um, the entire family, they... they they were taken, the entire village, okay. about 885 Jewish people, they were all taken mm -hmm. to Auschwitz. <coughs> only, my, only my grandmother survived, as far as I know. Yeah, desperate. So, did you get saved? Did I? Well, I get saved. My friend, I gave him six weeks, I think he gave me six weeks, you know what I mean? He gave you six weeks? The last. Yeah, the last one to keep her. You know, I, I mean, the last one was six weeks. Oh, and I see. 20 years later, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very encouraging. How did your friends react? Did you get to see it? How did your friends react to your Oh, friends? oh I see. Uh, oh, um. It makes me think I didn't have any friends. <laughs> 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 it's, a good, it's a good question. Uh, I don't think I was really, I mean, I, I, I think I was, I was working in the city, I was working at Deutsche Bank at the time, and I think I was very much in that well. So, I mean, those were my, like, my, my friends. Did and, they and mostly it, friends to What? The people turned their back on you? I don't think I had that many Jewish friends. I don't think I was embedded that much in the Jewish mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I had work with lots of different people, and, uh, and I, I suppose I would, I don't, I think people were, were polite people, people I, I knew weren't, weren't particularly frustrated. But I did get around to telling my family, of course, and Nina, and they were, that was, that was hard and challenging for them. Yeah. Um, but I, I think I was, I was a zealous young, young believer, encouraging my work colleagues to, to come and, and hear the gospel, because we worked in the city and there, we had lunchtime talks that people could come and see. Yeah, so, but also, I mean, um, yeah. Yeah. What age were you? About 30. Yeah. Mid-child. <laughs> <laughs>
And did your mom and dad, did they come to know Christ then? No, they're they still did? alive and they still have it, so you can pray for them, Hilda right. and Alan. Yeah. No, it's um, very hard for them. My dad can, we can talk about these things, but doesn't understand these things. And my mum is, is very resistant. Right. She doesn't want to, doesn't want to engage. And um, she's also very quick to close down. She gets a whiff of what's happening. She, she'll close down that conversation. And she, she's been doing that for many years with different friends who have tried to present <coughs> the gospel to her. And she would say things like, if you want to remain my friend, you, should, you must never mention Jesus to me ever again. That's, and I think that's, that's very, very hard, uh, but also fascinating insight into people, the, the, the prejudice and the, the, the anger, uh, maybe, because of what's happened over the years, or what she inherited from her parents. You want, you want to ask me one more question? You do? Okay. Do you, you want to know how I became a believer, right? Yeah. So, uh, I had a very good friend at university. He wasn't Jewish or Christian. And we used to discuss and agree that God was unknowable. We didn't, we didn't know God. We were in the dark. And uh, so we didn't know things of God. But we weren't atheists. We, we just just didn't know. We, we knew that God hadn't spoken to us. And so we, that was it. But a couple of years later, to, to all of our astonishment, my friend became a Christian. And we all thought this was a really bad idea, but if you'd asked us what a Christian was, we weren't going to be too sure. But he uh, invited me along and his other friends along to a guest event in his church, and I ended up doing a, a short course called Christianity Explored, looking at one of the eyewitness accounts of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. It was Mark's Gospel. And there I was discovering a Jesus I never could have imagined. He could heal the sick, raise the dead, calm the storm with the word, and I thought, Maybe Jesus could be the Messiah that we were taught about in the synagogue as children. But then I thought, how can I possibly believe that Jesus is the Messiah when the rabbis have been rejecting Jesus for the last 2,000 years? My curiosity was piqued. I was on a journey. I wasn't going to stop. But, but my prejudice was certainly rising. Uh, but fortunately, a friend of mine uh, uh, recommended a book, this book here, called Betrayed. I've got, a, I've got a good pile of these books. If you were thinking about investing in one book tonight, it would be this book. About a, a very successful American Jewish businessman, and one day his daughter ran home from university and said that she, she had some news, which was disturbing for them, and then she eventually told them that she believes in Jesus. And above all, um, they felt betrayed. They didn't know why their daughter had done this to them. Um, but the book really, uh, with all Jewish people, we have this... We, we believe the social contract that Jews don't believe in Jesus. And so the book is just really helping us understand it. It's, 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 Jews can believe in Jesus. It should be the most natural thing for a Jewish person to believe in Jesus. Um, but the book really pushes many of the prophecies in the Hebrew Bible about the coming of the Messiah. And uh, growing up, I, I had no idea there were so many prophecies, hundreds of prophecies. And as I was poring over these prophecies, for me, was a realization as I came to, it was almost like I came to understand, as, as, as it were, it was a bit like a finger meeting a fingerprint as I began to, as I was seeing the gospel, as I was beginning to see how Jesus was being foretold in the Hebrew Bible. And in my very first week as a believer, I was overwhelmed with two strong emotions. The first was joy because I found a great treasure. My life was full of meaning and significance as I understood that, that I'd been made by God that life could have meaning. But the other emotion I felt was fear, because for the very first moment in my life I realised that I'd never honoured God as my King, Creator and Sovereign Lord, that I'd never done that. Many of the things I'd done, shameful things, were, were, were rising within me. Things that never disturbed me before were overwhelming, but the thing that overwhelmed me more than anything else was my attitude. As I saw for the first time in my life, my attitude was like my, my independent attitude what the Bible would call sin. And that's when the penny really dropped as I understood that Jesus, the Son of God, had come from heaven to earth to die taking the punishment for my sin, <coughs> that I could be forgiven, not because of anything I had done, all I'd done was contribute my sin, but what he had done as he had borne the wrath of God in his substitutionary death that, to make me acceptable to the Father. And uh, this was... A defining, defining moment, an experience for me, as I experienced what God had done 
for me. And I, 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 as the years went on, I came to realize I know something that most Jewish people do not know. And I got to know Jews for Jesus and other organizations like, like Jews for Jesus. And eventually they offered me the opportunity to come on board and work with them to just to help in some small, humble way to help Jewish people understand that Jesus is our Messiah. Any questions? Okay. Let me read to you. We're going to read to you from Leviticus 1 and then uh, Numbers 19. So let me read to you. I think we're just going to read the first uh, nine verses of, Le of Leviticus 1. So when, when you're ready, um, I'll read to you. But before I do that, I forgot, I was just about to do the thing I, I, I did yesterday. I think it's really, um, really important just to make a, a comment about the ongoing situation in, and tragedy really in, in Gaza and Israel. Um, what's going on it is an absolute misery beyond belief, but this is the nature of war. War is obviously terrible. And so we have to say we grieve with those who grieve and we trust the Lord amidst the suffering. And suffering is something we all understand and we know this is our opportunity to draw closer to the Lord in the midst of that suffering. Suffering does serve a purpose. But what we know here is every loss of life is tragic. War is terrible beyond the imagination. But we know this, in this sin-wrecked world, not only is war inevitable, but we know that there is an enduring hope in the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. So we can pray for Israelis and for Palestinians together to come to know the Prince of Peace, so they can be reconciled with their Creator. So we can pray for many to turn to the Lord, we can pray for the war to end, we can pray for hostages to be released. And on commenting on war, it's always impossible to take sides without being perceived as endorsing the suffering of the other, if not in, indeed demonising the other side altogether. It's always considered unacceptable to defend the position of any country that causes harm to others. But we must acknowledge that all nations and all members individually of that nation are sinners before a holy God. And that we all desperately need a saviour. So if we have to take sides in the situation, we take sides with the Lord Jesus. And it's his kingdom that we promote. A kingdom where there'll be no sin, no suffering, no shame, no war, no death. No. Let me read you from Leviticus chapter 1. The Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you should bring your offering of livestock from the herd or from the flock. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you should offer a male without blemish. You should bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting, that he may be accepted before the Lord. He shall lay his head on the burnt offering and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Then he shall kill the bull before the Lord and Aaron's sons, the priests shall bring the blood and throw it against the sides of the altar that is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Then he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. And the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. And Aaron's sons, the priest, shall arrange the pieces, the head and the fat on the wood that is on the fire on the altar. But its entrails and its legs he shall wash with water. The priest shall burn all of it on the altar as a burnt offering, a food offering, with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. To the Lord. And there's one additional verse I'll, I'll throw in as well from Leviticus 7. And the priest who offers any man's burnt offering shall have for himself the skin of the burnt offering that he has offered. And I'll turn now to 
Numbers 19. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the statute of the law that the Lord has commanded. Tell the people of Israel to bring you a red heifer without defect, in which there is no blemish, and on which a yoke has never come. And you shall give it to Eliezer the priest, and it shall be taken outside the camp and slaughtered before him. And Eliezer the priest shall take some of his blood with his finger and sprinkle some of his blood towards the front of the tent of meeting seven times. And the heifer shall be burnt in his sight, its skin, its flesh, and its blood with its dung shall be burnt. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet yarn and throw them into the fire, burning the heifer. Then the priest shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterwards he may come into the camp, but the priest shall be unclean until evening. The one who burns the heifer shall wash his clothes in water and bathe his body <coughs> in water, and he shall be unclean until evening. And a man who is clean shall gather up, gather up the ashes of the heifer and deposit them outside the camp in a clean place, and they should be kept for the water, kept for the water for purification for the congregation of the people of Israel. It's a sin offering. And the one who gathers the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. And this shall be a perpetual statute for the people of Israel and for the stranger who sojourns among them. Whoever touches the dead body of anyone shall be unclean seven days. He shall cleanse himself with water on the third day and on the seventh day, and so be clean. But if he does not cleanse himself on the third day and on the seventh day, he will not be clean. Whoever touches a dead person, the body of anyone who has died and does not cleanse himself, defiles the tabernacle of the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from Israel, because the water for purification was not thrown on him. He shall be unclean, his uncleanness is still on him. This is the law when someone dies in a tent. Everyone who comes into the tent and everyone who is in the tent shall be unclean seven days. And every open vessel that has no cover fastened on it is unclean. Whoever in the open field touches someone who was killed, who was killed with a sword or who died naturally, or touches a human bone or a grave shall be unclean seven days. For the unclean, they shall take some ashes of the burnt sin offering, and fresh water shall be added in a vessel. Then a clean person shall take hyssop and dip it into the water and sprinkle it on the tent and on all the furnishings and on the persons who were there and on whoever touches the bone, whoever touched the bone, or the slain, or the dead, or the grave. And the clean person shall sprinkle it on the unclean on the third day and on the, and on the seventh day. Thus, on the seventh day he shall cleanse him, and he shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and at evening he shall be clean. If a man who is unclean does not cleanse himself, that person shall be cut off from the midst of the assembly, since he has defiled the sanctuary of the Lord, because the water of impurity has not been thrown on him, he is unclean. And it shall be a statute forever for them, the one who sprinkles the water for impurity shall wash his clothes, and the one who touches the water for impurity shall be unclean until evening. And whoever, and whatever the unclean person touches shall be unclean, and anyone who touches it shall be unclean until evening. Why, why do we come to God? Why do we come to God? Now there is an opening question. Why do we come? Do we come for what we can get? Maybe I give to you and now you give to me in exchange. <coughs> or are, are we in it for what we can give? For the joy of it. Just giving for the joy of it. 
or are we in it so we can have our sins forgiven? And there are many who don't come to God at all. Maybe because of a personal experience, or because it's what they were taught, or maybe they hold an alternate belief, a belief they feel, feel better explains the world about us. Maybe they feel there is no need to understand the world at all. It is what it is. I'm not seeking to persuade you to believe, but I am going to share the origins of faith rooted in the risen and reigning Lord Jesus and demonstrate that the language of this faith is born in the offerings. In this talk is called Christ in the Offering. I mentioned exchange. I give to you and now you give to me. This is how most things work in the world. But it isn't, it isn't the way God sees things. We don't speak to God on equal terms. He is the creator. We his creation. He is all powerful and eternal. And we are limited. Presenting an offering is the way all relationships work. Really. How much more when relating to the creator of the universe? These are just some ideas. My hope is that is that we understand, as we understand the significance of the offerings, we will understand what the Messiah, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus, has accomplished for us. When Moses finished assembling the tabernacle, it went online, and the lights came on. How are we doing, Barry? So then, oh, we need to go back to the next slide, I think. I'm going to make you go back and forwards slightly. There we go. The, the glory of God descended upon the tabernacle. We read this in Exodus 40. Once Moses had completed building the tabernacle, God's glory descended. Then the cloud covering the tent of meeting. Then the cloud, cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. He was not able to enter. And this actually looks like a big handbrake moment. Moses has assembled the tabernacle, everything's put in place, the glory has descended, and now we're told that Moses cannot enter. And we may think the tabernacle is all about God dwelling with man, and now we find out it's kind of like no entry. No entry at all. I mean, the glory is descending. <clears throat> Everyone presumes we can have access to God wherever and whenever we like. But the tabernacle tells us nothing could be further from the truth. That God's glory was with them was something they, they should never, they should ever have taken for granted. And now the glory of God is towering over the tabernacle. Uh, we now know that the tabernacle is central to everything. It's an astonishing sight to have seen this. But if Moses can't approach, well, what's the point of God dwelling with them? And the opening verses of Leviticus reveal all. They tell us it began with verse 1. It began with a call. Leviticus 1, verse 1. The Lord called Moses at last and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of livestock from the herd or from the flock. The Lord told Moses, the Lord told Moses, tell the people to come, but not empty-handed. And to offer is to acknowledge friendship, love, 
pleasure, dependence. Do we grasp that we are to be grateful to our Creator? I have two boys. Do we have the first picture, Barry? Do you go back to the beginning. There we, there we, there we are. That's my wife, and that's me, <coughs> and, uh, and the, that's uh, Noah and Joseph, and Joseph is on the right, and Noah is on the left, and uh, they're missing me desperately, of course, and I'll be home soon. We don't demand our boys say please and thank you. I sensibly understand why these words are important, we use them ourselves, but a thank you is always voluntary. And the thank you isn't <coughs> limited to words. It can include actions, like a smile, or bringing a gift, an offering. And God prescribed for Israel two types of offerings, those <coughs> that were voluntary and those that were not. We read about them in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. When they are voluntary, they are a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Can you go to the bread, Barry? That'd be great, really great. <coughs> there you go. Can you see the, the bread and you might smell the fresh bread? When they are voluntary, they are a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And when they are not, they are not. The voluntary ones are the burnt offerings, the gift offerings, the fellowship offerings. You read them in the first eight chapters or so of Leviticus. The ones that are not are the sin offerings. They're not a pleasing aroma to the Lord. God detailed how the children of Israel were to approach. So let's jump into the beginning of Leviticus and see the burnt offering. Should we actually have a look at the very, maybe the, 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 the altar actually itself? There we go, there's, there's an altar, about, just about two and a half meters wide on the base, about 1.3 meters tall. So it's got, a, it's got a big grill on it. This is a big altar for burning burning animals. It takes pride of place. It's quite a significant thing. The whole animal is offered by a worshipper. And it will be consumed in the fire on the altar. Well, almost all of it. <coughs> we will return to that detail later on. The aroma was pleasing to the Lord and the Lord's favour was upon the one he was offering. It recalls Noah and his burnt offering. The first burnt offering in the Bible. Gratitude for deliverance. Gratitude for a new era. A pleasing aroma. A soothing balm for God's anger at sin. And for Genesis 8, and when the Lord smelled the pleasing, the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. It's apparent that mankind wasn't changed by the flood, but the, this burnt offering of Noah, well, God's attitude towards mankind on account of that burnt offering, it, it was changed. The burnt offering reversed the attitude of God. The burnt offering didn't remove sin or change man's sinful nature, but burnt offerings appease God's anger. And this is expressed in many passages in the Bible. The most famous burnt offering in the Bible, Abraham offered his son as a burnt offering. It's the quintessential act of obedience. God is looking for faith. And this is expressed in giving <coughs> all to God. And what more could Abraham have done to give, to give all? It's interesting, so Noah understood to make a burnt offering. He understood it would appease God's anger because <coughs> nothing changed about mankind. As God said, the intention of man's heart is still evil. Verse 3. <coughs> if his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he should offer a male without blemish. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting that he may be accepted before the Lord. A male, a bull, without blemish. I think there's a picture of the man leading the bull. There he is. You can just about catch the man 
who looks completely blotted out in white, but he's leading the bull. A male, a bull without blemish, spotless, costly. When King David, many years later, wanted to offer burnt offerings to the Lord to stop a plague, he said, I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. Right. Noah took the animals <coughs> into the ark, clean and unclean, a foretaste of the offerings. A distinction made between domestic and wild animals. Wild animals are distinct from domestic animals in that they cost nothing. The burnt offering, not only costly, but perfect. Without blemish, only the best for God. Mm. And tragically in Israel's history, they sinned against God in this way. Malachi 1 says, when you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? When you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Not only costly and perfect, but it's also a delicacy. Meat was an expensive delicacy in the Middle East, worthy of a great feast. And this was significant in the case of the fellowship offerings, when both the priest and the worshipper shared um, and ate the meat. They both ate after the best part, of course, the fat was offered to the Lord. And that verse again, listen to the word accepted. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer a, a male without blemish. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting that he may be accepted before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. The worshipper places his hands on the animal's head. I think there's a picture of a group of guys around a bull, just about here you can see. The worshipper places his hands on the animal's head, not a transfer of sin, but of acceptance. The worshipper kills the animal next to the altar. The priest collects the blood as it pours out of the dying animal. And he throws the blood against the sides of the altar. That very first picture we saw. In verses five to nine, then he shall kill the bull before the Lord, and Aaron's sons, the priests, shall bring the blood and throw it against the sides of the altar, that is, at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Then he shall flay the burnt offering, cut it to pieces. Then the sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire on the altar, arrange the wood on the fire, and Aaron's sons, the priest, shall arrange the pieces, the head and the fat, on the wood that is on the altar. But his entrails and his legs he shall wash with water, and the priest shall burn all of it on the altar as a burnt offering, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. The worshipper skins the animal. This is a really messy job. He chops up the carcass, washing off any excrement, giving each part to the priest piece by piece to burn. The worshipper does all of the dirty work so that the priest can be devoted to the holy task. Both the priest and the worshipper are very active in what must have been a moving ceremony. The worshipper is accepted just as the sacrifice was accepted. And there was provision for everyone, regardless of their personal wealth. In verse 3, the offering can be from a herd. In verse 10, from the flock. Verse 14, from the birds. It's inclusive, it's for everyone. And there is also atonement in verse 4. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Now atonement is mentioned just once concerning the burnt offerings. But when we come on to the sin offerings in Leviticus, this word appears many times and we are told time and again, and the priest shall make atonement for them and they shall be forgiven. Many times it says that, but here for the burnt offering, we just told it once. Uh, but, but not, but obviously, with that, it was mentioned once, but with no reference to making a turn, it meant it, without making reference to them being forgiven. It's not, that's not a sin offering, because the burnt offering is just about them being accepted. Atonement 
here is an English word that was created to mean at one moment. They had to create a word, it's about reconciliation. And the burnt offering here allows the priest to make atonement for the worshipper. Now after the fall of Adam and Eve, they dressed themselves with fig leaves. But God gave them instead an animal skin. Yeah. It was literally shed for them. And a moment ago I said all the burnt offering went up to God, well all except for the skin, which was given to the priest. Adam and Eve, once naked, were now dressed in animal skin, and so is our priest. We could say that the priest has skin in the game. To have skin in the game means you have an active interest in the success of something. If it fails, you fail. If it succeeds, you succeed. A company employee may have shares in the company, and we may say he has skin in the game. We can say that the priest had skin in the game, literally. And the skin in the game is a, was a phrase that was made famous by Warren Buffett. Uh, its origin has frequently been attributed to him. However, others say the source of the phrase has its origins in the derby races, as the owners, uh, they have the most riding on the outcome. <clears throat> but now we can see that the priests were the first with skin in the game. But this was no game. But the most unlikely outcome of the greatest fiasco of all time, Adam and Eve and their tragic betrayal of God. In response, they got skin. And now the priest is offered skin. Atonement has a range of meanings in the Bible, driven by the context. With the golden fiasco of the golden calf, we read, Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Here atonement means a ransom that keeps the guilty from suffering the penalty as it were a life for a life. And Moses wanted to offer his life. But atonement can also signify that someone has become ritually clean. In the case of the leper, we read later on in Leviticus, who has recovered his health miraculously and is to be recognised again or recognised as a member of the worshipping community. And the, and the priest shall offer the burnt offering and the grain offering on the altar. Thus the priest shall make atonement for him and he shall be clean, acceptable. The atonement can be a ransom. The atonement can be the moment the leper is made clean and accepted into the worshipping community. But with skin in the game, it reminds us that our shame needs to be covered. And that we all sin against our creator. Acceptance is the key to worship. If acceptance is unknown, worship is defective. The burnt offering is burnt whole, all except for its hide, as we have seen. And as the animal goes up in flames, it reminds us of the all-consuming glory of God. The unclean you and me in our sin can only be consumed by God's glory. To fly directly into the sun, do we have an image of the sun? There we do, there we do. To fly directly into the sun, which is never a good idea by the way, is to know certain exposure to untold heat. A million degrees on the surface of the sun, obliteration. But to come into the presence of the God who made the sun, his holiness will consume us. And this ultimately can only be understood as eternal hell, as opposed to eternal life. We've looked at the burnt offering. The sin offering, by contrast, was compulsory. I think we should be very glad that God has told us the truth. The fat is burned on the altar, and the rest of the animal is burned outside the camp. The greater the sin, and the greater the rank of the person committing the sin, this is reflected in the sin offering, of which there are many forms. 
the blood goes to places way beyond the size of the altar of the burnt offering. For an individual, it goes on the horns of the altar. For the nation or for the priest, the blood is sprinkled on the veil of the sanctuary and on the altar of a fragrant incense. And once a year, it extends inside the Holy of Holies, even unto the mercy seat upon the Ark of the Covenant. That's how far the blood goes. The greater the sin, the further the blood needs to go. Sin offerings, they come in two parts. There's a reparation one, but there's also purification. The purification offerings, they purged defilement from the holy objects of the tabernacle. This was all about purging defilement from the tabernacle. Uncleanness, in this way of thinking about it, is akin to a physical substance which is attracted magnetically to the temple, uh, to the tabernacle. Uncleanness here is akin to a, a substance that is magnetically attracted to the tabernacle and rushes inside it. The purification offerings, they removed this material from the sanctuary. It cleansed it. Leviticus 15, you shall keep the people of Israel separate from their uncleanness with these offerings, lest they die in their uncleanness by defiling my tabernacle that is in their midst. And this from the red heifer, whoever touches a dead person, the body of anyone who has died and does not cleanse himself, defiles the tabernacle of the Lord, and that person should be cut off from Israel, because the water of impurity was not thrown on him, she, he shall be unclean. It is the blood that cleanses and restores the holiness of the tabernacle. Blood is never eaten. It makes holy. The priests touch the food offerings and they become holy. And also the holy objects become holy. And if the, if the priest is not doing this, the sin of the people defiles the holiness of the tabernacle. When this wasn't addressed, the defilement eventually became so bad that God departed. And we read about that in Ezekiel. God's glory departed and judgment descended. The exile eventually overtook them and off to Babylon they went as it were the spiritual death of the nation. And we have spanned the guts and the glory, the sin and the skin, the blemish and the blood, the blood that makes holy. But let's briefly just look at Numbers 19 and that waters of purification, the water infused with the ashes of the red heifer. A young female cow who has never been pregnant or milked or yoked is burnt outside the city and its ashes infused in water. This is the red heifer. The process of making this water of purification made the priest unclean. The one who burnt the who burnt the heifer made them unclean. The one who gathered up the ashes made them unclean. The one who sprinkled the water was made unclean. And this water, when sprinkled on someone ritually unclean, made them clean. And now we understand that Jesus, God's Son, took upon himself the sin of us all and became unclean as he offered his life, so he could offer forgiveness to all who accept his offer, Amen. his offering of life unto death. He took our punishment so we could receive eternal life. Amen. And not come to a garden, but a city where there will be no tears, no guilt, no shame, but eternal joy. But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of his creation, he entered once and for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, oh, thus securing an eternal mm. redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a, of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more yeah. will right. the blood of Christ oh, glory who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish 
to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. <coughs> By means of his own blood, he offered himself. Where are you? Where, where are you? Perhaps the saddest verse in the Bible is God calling out to Adam and Eve, where are you? God knew where they were and calling out, where are you, only pointed out how much they were lost. <coughs> that question was an invitation to be found. Yeah. And so the first sacrifice in the Bible was God himself killing an animal to make clothing, to cover Adam and Eve's nakedness. God's invitation to us. Where are you? He calls us to return to him. At the appointed time, God allowed his son to be killed to cover our spiritual nakedness. And in this way, address the root of the problem, the disobedient and self-sufficient heart. Through Jesus' sacrifice, not only is God making us clean, he is changing our hearts by addressing the heart of the problem. He has provided a sustainable solution. Amen. The New Testament writers echo the language of acceptance found in the New Testament, in Leviticus. Right. The New Testament writers echo the language of acceptance found in Leviticus. They understood the reality of acceptance that was foreshadowed in the offerings. The Son of God, without blemish, put on human flesh. He put on skin to be our substitutionary sacrifice. His death, costly. His offering, once and for all. Amen. To offer us full acceptance. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Ransomed for us. You were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot from 1 Peter. His holiness contagious. What was marred in the garden was restored at the cross. He restores glory to God in the eyes of mankind. From Psalm 69. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Mighty are those who would destroy me, those who attack me with lies. What I did not steal, must I now restore? No one could ever approach God. Not even Moses, nor the priests. No one. Not without an offering. But it is God who has made the most generous offering of all. For God so loved the world that he gave <coughs> his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It was always of Christ, once veiled, now revealed, in the face of Adam and Eve's rejection of God in the Garden of Eden, his offering was the sweetest smelling offering. Restoring man to full favour with God. And how appropriate that Paul in the New Testament encourages us in Ephesians to walk again with God and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. What Jesus has done is beyond anything the old covenant could have dreamt of. It could only cover unintentional sins. It didn't address them. But in Messiah, he has finally and fully and righteously addressed all of our sins through his sin-bearing, skin-shedding, wrath-satisfying death so we can be acceptable in God's sight. There is no atonement for intentional sins. 
There was no atonement for intentional sin. God's desire is for all of us to come to him, whatever we've done. And today we can confess our sin. Whatever we have thought, whatever we have said, 1 John says if we confess our sins, yes. he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, Lord. People say if God is real, stand before me now, or surely he can write a message in the sky. But he fails to grasp that God has done everything possible to make his name known. Mm -hmm. He created this world. He created the nation of Israel. And he revealed himself through that nation to be the saviour of the world. Yeah. How does God want to be approached? He told them and he told us. As the glory descended upon the tabernacle, the first thing God told Moses was to come, but not empty-handed. God is looking for repentant hearts. A word of apology. Above all, he wants us. Mm. He wants our full devotion. Romans 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by the testing, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Yeah. And so it should come as no surprise that I'm going to finish our time <clears throat> with an invitation at the end <clears throat> to accept Jesus. But I'm also going to say to an invitation to make an offering and even to partner with Jews for Jesus. Let me tell you a little bit about Jews for Jesus. <coughs> we began in 1973 with one branch. Today we have 24 branches around the world in 14 countries. We're in London, but we're also in Paris. Ooh. We're in Berlin and Budapest. We are in the Ukraine, and really the most spiritually successful, fruitful place for all of our work still remains in the Ukraine. Uh, this is obviously the leader of the, U of the work in Ukraine says this is, a, this is a terrible time for Ukraine, but a glorious time for the gospel. We have a branch in Moscow, we have our largest branch in Tel Aviv, we have many others around the world, many in America. And just like that first branch, many of our branches have a plaque on the wall that says, Jews for Jesus established 32 AD, give or take a year. <laughs> Not exactly true. But even after 50 years, still only about 1% of Jewish people have any idea who Jesus is. So it is always my delight to be able to, to ask people to pray. It's an honour really for me to be standing before you, to be able to say, you know, thank you, thank you Tom for inviting me to, to speak twice, no less, so that I can just encourage you to pray. So I feel very honoured and the privilege is, is mine, all mine. I've been working full time with Jews for Jesus for 14 years and we engage Jewish people with the Gospel. We equip Jewish people to follow Yeshua and we inspire others to do the same. We say go and tell. Um, we go up. I know some slides of uh, there's that picture of Shimon. There's the red heifer. That, I'm only in the centre of this picture. Self-styled him and I because I'm the best dressed and it's nothing else. The next picture. Uh, this is uh, this Joseph in both of the pictures. Uh, so Shimon is on the left. Um, I met him. He's, he was. This is a Jewish guy born in Jerusalem, but I met him in in Laon, of all places. Would you believe? And uh, did, do you know Shimon? Someone must, must know Shimon. He was, he was a truck driver working for m and for many years. You must have seen him at some point. He didn't realize it. But um, eventually, especially in light of what's going on in Israel, he made a decision to go home, to sign up with the reserves. And he, in God's mercy, wonderfully, he now works as a police officer in Jerusalem. And when he had his interview, 
um, he was able to, to talk about being a believer in Yeshua. In Yeshua is just a Jewish way to say Jesus. And so you can pray for Shimon to be fruitful for him to, to, be, uh, to, to, to be just a, a very um, honest, wonderful, sincere believer amidst other officers in the police force in Jerusalem. So you can pray for Shimon. And, um, and on the other, which is Colin, a Jewish man I've known for many years. We would go out onto the streets and meet people, and I met, I met Colin this way. And Colin, uh, is recently, he's gone, gone to live over, overseas in, in his retirement. He's a, he's a wonderful extrovert, and you can pray for him that he would continue to be in the habit of wanting to share his faith with people that he meets. Go and tell, so we go out. And also, I go out into the community. There's a slide after this one, and the one after this one. We, we, we go out, we actually set up a, a thing called Rummy Cub. Have you, have you heard of Rummy Cub? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, it's, it's a great game, if you, if you like that kind of thing. But it's a great game. And um, we, we put it on in the communities because we wanted to, to serve the community. We befriended Jewish people in the community and also many Hindu women as well. So it's quite a, quite a, uh, a wonderful opportunity for all people. And we, people know that we run it. So we have those conversations with people, especially if they're there for the first time. And some Jewish people, they, they find out who we are and they don't want to come back again. That, that, but, they, but they know that we wanted to serve them. We go out into the community. Uh, um, and so we also say, so uh, come and see. So people might come to us through referrals, they might come online. And uh, I would say that our most, everything we do is we're, we're watering, we're sowing, but really, um, we're being faithful, but what's amazing is, uh, uh, is only, only the Lord does everything, we understand that. But people come to our website on a weekly basis, people are always coming, and I get a little report every week about the number, I have a look about the online work, and I always see like one or two Jewish people have prayed to receive the Lord that week. So this is a private corner, a private space, it's a, a, astonishing. People can come to us. You know, we sow with water, but only the Lord brings the growth. But people come to me, and I read the Bible with them. So we have the picture before here, and the picture before this one, in the bottom left of the corner, is a little, uh, I say it's a little Jewish man, he is quite small, uh, a Tunisian Jewish guy called Levi. God, um, Jesus revealed himself to, to Levi. And, uh, but I, I started to open the Bible with Levi just to be able to clarify John is really helping us understand the nature of God as a trinity in the beginning of John's Gospel. So God has spoken. God is clarifying to, to Levi who God is. And so we can, uh, so people come to us and I open John's Gospel with them. Our third pillar, so we have go and tell, come and see, love and serve. Our work in Israel, we set up a women's shelter for women who've fallen upon hard times. And we got a letter from the Knesset, from the Parliament, thanking us for having set up the first work of its kind in all of Israel. As a church and individually, there are many, many reasons you might want to support a Jewish ministry. But let me just say, Jesus, Jesus, we're not a, we don't talk politics. Uh, we don't relocate people from one place to another. We don't talk about the end times. But we do talk about Jesus. Um, it's the Apostle Paul who does a lot of the heavy lifting for me at this point because he has four very good reasons why people should really think about ministry to the Jewish people. He says in Romans 10, he says, It's my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Jewish people that they may be saved. He says in Romans 11, even as an apostle to the Gentiles, it's his prayer that the, Jew, that the Gentile believers in Jesus will provoke Jewish people to jealousy. He says in Romans 1 that the gospel has never stopped being first for the Jewish people. By Romans 15, he says that the Gentile believers in Jesus were very, very happy to send a material, financial gift to the, to the Jewish believers in Jerusalem. Because as they have received a spiritual gift from the Jewish people, they were now happy to send them a material gift. This is really an opportunity for you to, it's an invitation for you to participate in this work, to become part of our team. We send out a prayer letter every, every month. You can send it by post or by, by email. And also as a family, we send out, me and my wife, we send out a, a personal email once a month, giving people things to pray for that we're doing. 
As an organisation, we depend upon the generosity of God's people. And you may really, the Lord may be telling you, this is something you'd really like to partner with. And if that's you, I'd love you to stand with us. And I want to introduce you to the, to the only tradition that I believe in, which is, you have to hold this thing up first. Does everyone have one of these? They don't, do they? Do they? Some of you do. Do you? Oh, you do. Oh, you're being a bit shy. Can you hold it up for me? How did you get in here without one of these? <laughs> you hold it up for me. What I need you to do is, because there's a last page called Your Involvement, you just need to nick the little corner, because this is the tradition. Are you ready? It's called Tearing Off the Involvement Section in Unison on the Count of Three. Are you ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, Seven. Uh, unless you're very creative, you should only have two pieces of paper. You can pray for Shimon, you can pray for Colin, you can pray for Levi. But if you want to get the newsletter, I just ask that you 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 will look look on this. The box is to tick front and back. And if you wanted to give us a gift tonight, there is places for you here. <laughs> if you want to get the email, my only my only request is that you're writing clear block capital letters. It's not that I don't believe that you can do joined up handwriting, it's just that I can't read joined up handwriting. I'd love you to get the newsletter to stand with us. Let me just say there is no better way of blessing the Jewish people than by sharing the, the gospel. And that may be a difficult task, but what we can do is if we ever do, I mean, how many of you have Jewish friends? How many of you have friends? <laughs> uh, same as me, no friends. Okay. <laughs> A smile, turning to the person next to you. I mean, do what you can. If you can smile at someone, you, you're kind of getting there. If you can say hello to someone, you're feeling a little bit better. We're all very weak, and we're all, we all depend upon the Lord for this. So this is what I do. When I, I look at some situation, I think I want to be able to share the Lord with this person, but I'm thinking, Lord, I'm weak. I've got nothing, no idea what to say. I don't even know how to smile anymore. And I simply, I ask the Lord, Lord, help me to begin to begin a conversation with this person. I just pray that prayer then and there, and I see what the Lord does. He includes us. It's his privilege, our privilege to be included in his work. And he, he delights in his children. So let's call upon him. And if you meet Jewish people along the way, just give it a go. See what happens. You, you never know. I bought some books. There was a book I spoke about at the beginning. It's a wonderful opportunity you to read it, and that maybe you might give it to a friend, you might give it to a Jewish friend. Um, I've got some uh, Jewish gospel music, so if you want to know what the worship service will sound like in heaven, you have a little bit of a heads up there. Um, I think I've just got, let's come to a close. Will, will we offer ourselves to the Lord? In many ways, just as I just said, you know, express our dependence, revel in our privilege. You can pray. God hears your prayers. You can always ask for help. What would it look like to offer ourselves to the Lord? Just going to take a moment to ask the Holy Spirit to help us imagine what it would look like to offer ourselves to the Lord. Let's take a moment. <laughs> Let me just say, if you have never read accepted his invitation. <coughs> we can do that now. <coughs> He's calling you. Where are you? Where are you? He's calling you to accept his invitation. Let me pray a prayer and you can echo it in your heart. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you 
that we can call you Father. We thank you that we can come before you, that we can even speak to you. We come offering ourselves. We come recognizing we have sinned against you, Lord. And we recognize that you are infinitely holy and you're glorious. So we come before you in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus, the Saviour, knowing in him we can be acceptable and accepted before you, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for this abundant gift by which we can actually become called children of God, your children. So we, we ask, Lord, please accept, our, accept us in the name of the Lord Jesus and allow us to call upon your name. And we thank you in Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. Bless you, Ziggy. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Folks, uh, this evening we'll have a wee basket down the back again if you want to bless Ziggy tonight. And of course, there's the books on the other side of the door. Um, don't bless them, which you pay for but uh, no, praise the Lord. Great for the support, Jesus for Jesus. So, yeah, praise the Lord. Thanks. God bless you. I hope you will see you Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. <laughs>